pet owners, if you want to take better photos of your pets, here are my top five tips as a professional. In this video, we're going to be covering what I feel like are the five most important things that I see my students and new photographers struggling with. Whether you have a camera or a phone or, you know, you're about to upgrade, these tips are going to help you improve straight away without needing to get fancy equipment, fancy editing software or anything like that. You're going to see results immediately. Make sure you stick around to the very end of the video because I'm going to be sharing with you my favorite tip. And this is one that I'm telling to professional photographers and aspiring professionals in our one-to-one -one lessons. And I'm going to show you how I put it into practice in a photo shoot with my own dogs as well. So make sure you stick around for that. Let's get straight into it. So my first tip for today is about composition. And that is to not chop your dog. Whenever I say don't chop your dog, I'm always thinking about like cartoon drumstick legs going flying in all directions. That's not what I mean. What I'm talking about is I like this photo here, which is one of my old ones from a couple of years ago where I've chopped this dog right through his little wrist joints there. When I say don't chop the dog, I'm talking about not chopping off his little ear tips, his tail, his little toes, his little feet basically does not kind of chopping him awkwardly across a leg like this little pug here another one of my old ones or I've chopped him through the wrists this guy is kind of chopped just above the wrist and this just makes him feel a little bit uncomfortable now of course it's totally okay to have photos of the head and shoulders I do that all the time as you can see here and here and here and here and here <laughs> but then it's really best practice to chop them through the widest part of their shoulders otherwise if you're doing a kind of a full body portrait they're sitting down they're lying they're standing you really want to make sure that you're including the whole dog as well as giving them a little bit of room above their head and below their feet so that they feel really comfortable in the photo the next tip is all about light and using light in our photography to create more beautiful photos. For some reason, somewhere along the line, when we start taking photos of our dogs, we have this assumption that more light is going to equal better photos. And of course, we need some light and a decent amount of light to take good photos of our pets. However, more in this case is not always better. When we're shooting in full sunlight, especially full, harsh, like midday sunlight, like you can see here in this photo of Loki, we can run into a ton of problems. Really bright highlights, super dark shadows, really directional light. So here it's hitting him from the side and it's making half his face really dark and half his face really shiny. And it basically just isn't that flattering because the light is really harsh. When you're taking photos of your pets, you really want to be on the lookout for the lighting conditions, whether the light is harsh or soft, and the lighting direction. Is it coming from the side, behind the dog, or in front of the dog? I could do a whole video on lighting, so my main tip for now is to really try and avoid full, harsh, direct sunlight. If you're going to be shooting under those conditions, make sure the light is hitting the dog in the face. Otherwise, I would recommend waiting for overcast days or for when the light gets softer at golden hour or even just heading somewhere shady so that you aren't dealing with that crazy harsh sunlight. If you're enjoying learning about taking better photos of your pets and you want more tips, tricks, advice, information, make sure you hit like and subscribe and the bell. And I don't know, I'm new on YouTube. So also let me know in the comments if there are videos that you would like to see me do in the future things you're struggling with in pet photography, things you'd like to learn, and I will try and make those videos for you. In the meantime, make sure you subscribe so I can keep making videos, because if there's no one here, then I'm just talking to myself like a weirdo. Let's get back into the next tip. The next tip is all about purpose. Now look, I know that your pet is cute, my pet is cute too, and I know that we all want 100,000 photos of our dogs sleeping here and there and on the couch, a little croissant. But <laughs> if we're trying to take our pet photography to the next level and we want to make something really beautiful and that we're going to treasure and that we're going to look at and be like, oh my God, that's my dog. We're going to want to put a little bit more thought into the 
location that we're taking our photo and what it is that we want to show about that time, that place, that moment, that dog. And there are a lot of elements that go into this and I spend most of my life teaching people exactly all about these elements and how they can come together to tell a cohesive story. But for today, the main one is just to be consciously thinking about the purpose of your photo and the location that you've chosen to put your dog and whether that is going to help support your purpose or maybe not. So for example, in these photos here, I've got a really lovely German Shepherd or two in front of a really ugly chain link fence or an ugly gate and just some kind of trash going on there. And it's just not that pretty. Like these photos are kind of fine but the stuff in the background just really, for me, takes away from them because we don't have good connotations when it comes to chain link fences or ugly gates. The one of the little Frenchie down the bottom just has this fluoro green swirls in the background, I guess from a hose. And for me, it's just not that cute. <laughs> it's just not that pretty. And the last dog here has got sticks coming out of its butt. And now that you've seen them, you would not be able to unsee them. So just putting a little bit of thought into where you're putting your dog and what you want to say about that time and place. I see a lot of people who just plonk their dog down on the street somewhere and take a photo and off they go. And there's like trash cans in the background and like Starbucks cups, whatever else and it just takes away from what could be a really lovely photo if they just moved a little bit, got something else in the background, just thought a little bit more about how they can convey this time and place in a beautiful photo. Because, okay, it's fine to have happy snaps and they have nothing against happy snaps. I have several thousand photos of my dog sleeping on the couch or just being in the woods. But if you want to take really like lovely photos of your pets, which is why I hope you're here, then you want to put a little bit more thought into where, what, why, how, what you're trying to show to your audience. My last tip, is, no, not last tip, my second last tip is about editing. And this does not have to be fancy. I'm not going to give you a full editing tutorial, but it is really worthwhile just spending a couple of minutes to have a look at your photo and see if there are any changes that you can make to enhance them. In this example, for example, which is a mistake I see a lot of new and beginner photographers making, my black and white dog is very, very blue. And I know for a fact that he is not actually blue, he is black and white. So fixing the white balance, also known sometimes as the temperature or the tint of your photo, can really take it to a better place and make it look a bit more natural. I also know that snow is not blue, it is usually white. Um, so there's a lot of blue going on in this photo. So any editing program, whether it's just the most free basic one that comes with your phone or it's one you've downloaded, will have a way to change the temperature and the tint. In this case, all I would need to do pretty much is to slide the temperature slider towards yellow, maybe change the tint. I'd have to have a look at the photo, but it's really worthwhile making sure that your dog is the correct color for what their coat is supposed to be. And my very, very last tip for today, I want to show you a couple of example photos and I want you to see if you can spot what the difference is before I tell you the tip. So here we go. These ones are taken with my phone and then I have a couple with the camera coming up too. So here we've got the first example. These were taken with my phone. Have a look. What's the difference? Did I edit them differently? Did I change location? Here's another example. Don't mind the quality of the photos. They've been like imported places, exported, resized, made smaller for websites. It's fine. Uh, here comes another one. I really love this one. This one was also taken with my phone. So what's the difference? Okay, I'm a little bit closer on one of them, but other than that, there are some other big differences. Okay, so here's another example. This one is with my camera. So we have this option or this one. Uh, another example could be this option versus this one. I've also got this, which is very cute, compared to this. And lucky last, we have Loki here on this stump compared to this one. Again, the photo quality has gone a little bit there. I think it's just been exported small. So what is the difference? I'm going to show you with some behind the scenes clips. Basically, it's all about getting down low. So 
when you're taking photos of pets, you really, really need to be at their level. For most people, they think this means eye level, but as you're going to see in a couple of these clips coming up, when I get down to eye level, it actually still has the perception of being a little bit too high. So it's even better when I get closer to the ground, pretty much as low as I can go. My camera is usually this to this high off the ground, depending on what's going on. Of course, there's not gonna be a one size fits all solution here, but in general, I found that most of my students do not get low enough to the ground to really get a bit of depth from a blurry foreground, to get a real sense of presence from the dog and to get that real connection with the dog. Let's have a look at that, this in action with three examples. One where I'm standing up, one where I'm at eye level to the dog and one where I'm really, really low to the ground and see which photo you think gives the most story, shows the most about where the dog is, gives the most connection, and gives the dog the most presence. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this really interesting. If you have any questions or comments, of course, drop them below in the comments box. Otherwise, if you want more pet photography tips, advice, and information, why don't you go check out the most recent video I posted, which has a ton of behind the scenes, as well as an editing tutorial at the end using Lightroom. You can download the file and edit along. So go jump on it and I will see you next time.